Students, so welcome to uh, the second video in uh, topic 8.1, and it's going to be kind of a long one, so you probably want to break it up into a couple of sections. Um, the reason why I'm not breaking it up into two separate videos is because uh, I want to I want to encompass all of renewable energy sources in one video. Okay, now remember the last video we talked about renewable and non-renewable uh, energy sources and types of energy sources. So because renewable energy sources are really the future, uh, it's uh, it seems it seems entirely appropriate to devote an entire um, part of this class to it. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is nuclear power, and we've already talked about nuclear reactions and fission and fusion before, back in topic seven. Okay, and we said then that fusion naturally occurs in stars, and fission is the type of nuclear reaction that's used in weapons and as an energy source. Okay, and in particular, fission involves uh, the transformation of heavy nuclei reacting to form lighter nu nuclei and we use neutrons to do this and it was discovered in 1939 by the Germans okay now it turns out that um, uranium-235 is the best fuel in fact it is the only isotope of, of uranium that um, reacts appropriately with neutrons bombarding it in order to start a chain reaction, okay? Now the problem is that natural uranium, uranium that occurs in nature that can be dug up and, and mined, um, is almost completely uranium-238, that isotope, okay? So uh, uranium-235 only constitutes about less than 1% of, the, of, its, of, its, of its weight. So we have to um, undergo a process called enrichment in order to increase the percentage of uranium-235 in that, in that material. And it generally needs to be greater than um, or equal to about 3% of uranium-235. Now, you don't have to worry about how enrichment takes place, but you need to be aware of that term and aware that um, most of natural uranium is uranium-238, okay? Now, we've already studied what happens when a neutron hits a, um, a uranium nucleus. Okay, so what it does is the neutron ends up being captured by the by the nucleus, and it creates very briefly the uranium-236 nucleus. Now that's a very unstable nucleus, so what it does is it immediately splits into lighter nuclei. And one possibility, for example, uh, it can actually create several different types of elements uh, in addition to more neutrons. That's the key, of course, as we learned before. In this case, barium, barium and krypton. Okay. In this case, it's three neutrons produced, and it hits other nuclei of the original material again and again. These three neutrons do, and that's called a chain reaction, which we've studied. Now, a certain amount of the original material must be present for chain reactions to continue effectively. This is called the critical mass. For uranium-235, it's about 15 kilograms. If you have 15 kilograms of uranium-235 and you successfully hit one 235 nucleus with a neutron, you're going to have a, a chain reaction, all right? And very high amounts of energy can be produced by every single nuclei, as we discovered before, about 173 mega electron volts. Now, the uranium-235 nucleus will only capture neutrons if they're not going too fast. They have to be going just the right speed. And they're slowed down by atoms in uh, what's in what's called a moderator. So remember, we're talking about um, using nuclear the nuclear reaction for uh, for for um, for power generation. So this is a this is a this is a big building that has all these things. It has um, the steam generator, pumps, fuel rods, control rods, and all this stuff. Okay, so there are these things called moderators. And what the moderators are, this is, this is a material that surrounds the fuel rods. And the fuel rods are, of course, that's where the uranium-235 hangs out, okay? In this example, this is a gas-cooled reactor. So what happens is, is as the moderator slows down those, um, those neutrons, it gets hot because of the conservation of energy, of course, right? So we have to have, you have to have cold water uh, sort of circulating through in order to cool the moderators, and this is called the heat exchanger, okay? Now this water boils, and then the steam is used to turn the turbine, which of course ends up producing electricity. And the rate of reactions is determined by the number of neutrons hitting the uranium-235 nucleus, okay? And, um, and, those are, and those are called the control rods, all right? Another kind of reactor is called a pressurized water reactor. Uh, you don't really need to understand how both of these work in great detail, but just be aware that there's mainly two different kinds, all right? Another typical reaction, this one I think we've studied before, okay? Um, this shows that, so in this particular reaction, we have two extra neutrons which are able to continue that um, chain reaction. The point is that 
um, these two elements here are themselves radioactive and they need to be gotten rid of, okay? So this brings up the point, which we said before, about, uh, about the disposal of radioactive material, which is a downside to nuclear power, of course. Sometimes a radioactive product can be recycled and itself reused as a fuel. Plutonium is a good example of this, okay? And the most recent sort of nuclear disaster or nuclear issue that was in the news was the uh, was the Fukushima um, Japan nuclear reactor disaster after that after the tsunami? Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit for each of the renewable energy sources. I'm going to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages. Okay, the advantages of nuclear power has very high power out output, very very high energy density. Okay, we have large reserves of nuclear fuels. Okay, and they're generally sustainable because we you don't actually need a lot to start that chain reaction. 15 kilograms of uranium is not very much, and there's no CO2 emission from it, so it's great. There's no, we we're not we're not destroying the environment by using nuclear power unless there's an accident. Okay, so there's a there's a major public health hazard if there's an accident. Um, and uh, uranium mining is actually environmentally destructive, but nowhere near as much as coal, for example. And of course, the radioactive waste is very difficult to dispose of. And then there's also an issue of, well, what if terrorists could obtain nuclear material, which is unfortunately probably not as difficult as you, as you think, okay? All right, let's do a few examples, all right? So I have one kilogram of U-235. U-238 contains about... 0.7% of uranium-235 by mass. Calculate the this, this specific energy of uranium-238, okay? Well, this is pretty easy. It's just um, 0 0.007 uh, times the release of the 235, so that's 4.9 times 10 to the 11 joules per kilogram, okay? All right, now here's a nuclear power plant problem. You should probably work through this one. Okay, so a nuclear power plant has an efficiency of 35%. It produces 800 megawatts of power. The energy release in the fission of one nucleus of U-235 is 170 mega electron volts. Estimate the mass of uranium used per year. Rarely this problem becomes um, almost a like a factor label or a, a bridge method, a units conversion problem, okay? So first of all, we have to figure out the, uh, the amount of power in. Okay, and uh, what we're given in the problem, we have the 800 times 10 to the 6 divided by 0.35, which is the efficiency, 2.286 times 10 to the 9th watts, okay, and the energy produced in one year, you just do this conversion, it's 7.2 times 10 to the 16. Now, in one fission reaction, okay, you see I'm using the bridge method here, I find that it's 2.72 times 10 to the minus 11 joules, okay, all right, so in order to convert that, you would... Um, you would multiply it by one reaction by that, and then the answer that we got in the first part, which is 7.209 times 10 to the 14, you get that in effect that there are 2.65 times 10 to the 27 reactions per year. Um, and then you can obviously figure out the mass, um, the mass of uranium used per year, which is actually not that much. It's just over 1,000 kilograms of uranium. All right, and, and and remember that it's 15 kilograms is the magic number that gives us that's the critical mass that will start the chain reaction. Okay, all right, so let's let's switch gears to solar power. Okay, um, so solar power is a is a is a uh, really really promising way to get energy. Uh, the sun is always shining somewhere on the earth, and it's always clear somewhere on the earth, okay? But, but before we really get into it, let's talk about uh, a few things about the sun, which is, of course, is our star. You know that the sun is a huge nuclear fusion reactor, uh, and we'll study this more when we talk about astrophysics. It's made of hydrogen and helium. The surface temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin, which turns out to not be hot enough for fusion, but in the inside... Uh, of the sun, it's extremely, it's much, much, much hotter where actually fusion occurs in the core. And the sun produces in all directions in three-dimensional space, uh, it's about four times 10 to the 26 joules per second. That's a lot of power, right? The amount of power per square meter incident on the top layer of the Earth's atmosphere is about 1,380 watts per square meter. And that's called the solar constant, which you'll talk about more in topic 8.2. Um, now, it turns out that not all of that energy makes it to the surface. About 1,000 watts per square meter makes it to the surface, assuming the sun is overhead on a sunny day. And that's because, uh, you know, the, the, sun's, the sun needs to go through the atmosphere, and there are a lot of other factors, okay? The average over a 24-hour period is about 340 watts per square meter. And, of course, you all know what causes the seasons. The Earth is tilted on its axis. 
you may not know that the Earth is much closer, um, it's much closer to the sun in January than it is in July, okay? And when it's closer, it's called the perihelion. And when it's farther away, it's called the aphelion, okay? Um, and this difference in distance, uh, it's about a 7% uh, difference, right? So it's about 7% more intense in January than it is in July, the, solar, the incoming solar radiation. Okay. Now, there are two types of solar devices that um, allow us to get energy from the sun. The first is called an active solar device. And this is any device that uses sunlight to directly heat something, like, for example, air or water. You travel to some countries. Uh, in fact, a lot of countries have these big black barrels on the roofs of buildings. Well, those are active solar devices. They're actually heating the water that's then going to come down for their showers and their household use. Okay. Uh, the typical solar panel... <clears throat> um, deals with a, it's a flat collecting surface covered by glass, and often there's a black surface underneath, okay? Uh, and some have parabolic mirrors to boil water into steam and so forth. That's called the solar panel, okay? All right, and let's do an example with a solar panel, okay? So I have a four square meter solar heating panel positioned in a place where the intensity of the sun is 1075. What's the power incident? Well, that's easy. You know that intensity is power over area. Solve for power, you get 4,300 watts. If it's 50% efficient, obviously half of that is absorbed per second. And this one's interesting. If one liter of water throws, flows through the system in one minute, how much will its temperature increase? Well, in one minute, it's 1.3 times 10 to the 5 joules. And then we, again, this is a thermal physics question uh, where we end up that we find that it's a, about a 31 degree Celsius temperature rise. Okay. All right, the other device that allows us to harness solar energy is called the photovoltaic cell. And this is the one that you probably are more familiar with in terms of what you've seen. Um, a lot of schools and businesses uh, have, have these on top, and these are those big bluish shiny panels, okay? So these are not, these are technically not solar panels, and those people, people call them solar panels. These are photovoltaic cells, and now you know that those two things are not the same thing, okay? But we often use them interchangeably, okay? So what these are, these are, um, these are sem they are semiconductors, and what they do is they release electrons when photons of light are absorbed, okay? And basically this creates an electric field that causes those freed electrons to flow in an external circuit, thereby creating electricity, okay? So but the potential difference in the current produced by a single voltaic cell is very, very small. So what happens is you have to uh, connect many, many of them together, okay? Now photovoltaic cells are only about 30% efficient. Uh, cost less than four dollars per watt, which is about the same cost as diesel-powered generators. Okay, and these 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 um, photovoltaic cells last about 20 years. Okay, so you don't need to know the details of exactly how a photovoltaic cell works in terms of um, the electron and so forth. You should have a general sense of it, but you're not going to be asked any technical questions about that. Okay, if I were you, I'd pause the video and work through this problem um, slowly and take your time. This is a, this is a past paper question. Okay, so a photovoltaic cell of one square centimeter, if it's 15% efficient, okay, so my power, there's my 0.15, I get 0 0.015 watts. The potential difference across the cell is 0.5. How much current? Well, we just use P equals IV. We've done that before. If 10 of these cells were placed in series, what would be the total potential difference? Well, you know that potential drop is additive across devices in series, so it would be 0.5 times 10, which is 5. If 10 of these cells were placed in parallel, what would the total current be? And you know that current splits through parallel components, of course, so that would be 0.31 amps. And then finally, how many of these cells would you need to produce 100 watts? Well, then my version of P equals IV changes slightly, and I need this N right here, so I have to solve for N, and I get 6,451, okay? Okay. So the advantages of solar power, it's very high quality, it's very clean, very good for the environment, There's no, there are no emissions, uh, atmospheric emissions whatsoever, very dependable, the sun is always shining, it's free, and it's essentially inexhaustible, all right? Now, the disadvantages are, obviously, it's only available during the day, it's obviously affected by cloudy weather in the seasons, it has a low power output unless you have many, many, many of them, and it has very high initial costs. It costs a lot of money to set up these, these sets of um, photovoltaic cells. You need lots of area, 
Sometimes people don't like to look at them, although I think they kind of look pretty cool. Uh, and there are chemical effects at the place of manufacture. Uh, the factories where these are produced, there's a lot of chemical, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of issues, and they've got to be careful about the environmental impact of that. Okay? All right. The, second, uh, the third kind of power source, I want to talk about hydroelectric power. And this involves any, any situation where you're getting energy from falling water. Okay, so obviously gravity is the main source here. So initially, remember that all of this energy comes from the sun, okay, uh, in terms of water, because uh, the, the earth is heated. That's what cause, cl causes clouds. Well, how is it heated? It's heated from sunlight. Um, and then the clouds make the rain, and that's where the water comes from, okay? So the mass of water, if you consider a mass of water M following a vertical height, so obviously there's a conversion of, of potential energy to kinetic energy, okay? Now, if I say that this mass of water, knowing that the density of water is the mass over the volume, the mass would then be the density times the, times the volume, and you know for water it's about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, all right? Then what you can do is you can express the power, which is energy over time, Energy being the gravitational potential energy of that water before it falls, that's mgh over delta t. Well, now I substitute rho delta v for m, and I get the interesting result that the power uh, generated by falling water is the density of water times the volume per unit time times the acceleration due to gravity times its height. And this delta V over delta T that I've highlighted in blue here is called the volume flow rate. So when we're talking about hydroelectric power, the rate at which mass is, is flowing or falling is absolutely critical. Okay. Now hydroelectric schemes are used in mountainous areas, obviously with lots of lakes, or dams can be built. All right. As an example, we can find the power developed when water in a stream with a flow rate of 50 liters per second falls from a height of 15 meters. This is, this is a very easy problem and it's easy to conceptualize. We just use P equals energy per unit time, mgh over delta T, and I got 7,400 watts for this, all right? Now, many hydroelectric schemes use what's called a pump storage system. And what these are, these are situations where um, the, the, the water flowing lower down is pumped back higher again use, using the generators of the power plant, okay? Now, they're also using uh, extra energy in order to do this because if they didn't, they would be vi violating the laws of, um, of energy conservation. It looks something like this, right? So comes down. It's in this lower reservoir. They pump it back up. And remember that essentially... Um, when you store water in a reservoir, that is stored potential energy. That is stored electricity just sitting there waiting to be used, okay? Now, the extra energy that they, that they get from the grid comes at non-peak time. So effectively, what this does is this allows storage of energy, which is the water in the reservoir. When the demand or the price is high, they can release it and then sell that and make more money. I'm talking about the power company, all right? Now, advantages of hydroelectric power. Okay, well, it's essentially free, right? We don't have to pay for the water falling from the sky. It's inexhaustible, and it's very good for the environment. There, there are no emissions, okay? Now, the disadvantages are, obviously, the need for water. So if you're in a drought or uh, if you live in a, in a desert area, this is going to be a real challenge, right? It also requires significantly changing the environment. Every time we build a dam, uh, it, it, it floods an area that's not normally supposed to be underwater, and this can be a big hassle, and they're very high initial cost. To build these turbines here inside of a hydroelectric power plant is very, very, very expensive, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the Hoover Dam, which is in the southwestern part of the United States, okay? Hoover Dam is 221 meters high, and it holds a lake called Lake Mead behind it, which is a gigantic lake, which you can see from space, okay? So to call it a lake, well, it's not really a lake, it's, I guess it's a reservoir, but it has an area when it's full, when it's completely full, of 694 square kilometers. It hasn't been full since 1983, by the way, because of increased pressures for water use in the American Southwest, plus drought and other factors like that, okay? So let's estimate the mass of water in Lake Mead when it's at full capacity, all right? Well, the, vo the volume is gonna be the depth times the area, 2.4 times 10 to the 10th cubic meters, and you know that one cubic meter has a mass of 1,000 kilograms, so this is 2.4 times 10 to the 13 kilograms. How much potential energy? Well, we have to be creative about this, and we have to consider the average height of the water above the bottom. It's going to be half the height of the dam, so I'm going to use 110.5 in my GPE calculation here. Now, the dam can produce 1.5 times 10 to the 9th watts of electricity. 
power station is 80% efficient. How much PE must be lost per second from the water to produce it? That's just the PN and the E is P out over PN. I get 1.9 times 10 to the ninth joules. And then finally, what mass of water must flow through the turbines each second to produce this power? I have my P equals MGH over delta T. And then I just solve for M uh, setting delta T equal to 1. Okay? Okay, and let's do one more example with hydroelectric before we round out this video with wind power. Okay, so there's a mountain hut. It has 43 light bulbs, 50 watt light bulbs, a 1 kilowatt electric heater, and a 2 kilowatt cooker. What's the total power consumed of all the appliances that are in use at the same time? You would just add all of these. Okay, so it's 5150 watts. And outside the hut is a 5 meter high waterfall. The guy who owns the hut is interested in building a small hydro generator. And he would probably like to know how many kilograms of water must flow per second um, in order to generate enough power, okay? So we again, we're going to use this equation, and we're going to solve for M. We get 105 kilograms, which doesn't seem like that much, right? But then you consider seasonal variations that might be drier in the summer. If there's a drought, well, that's a real problem, okay? Okay, finally, wind power. Okay. Now, like, like hydroelectric power, wind power is initially the sun's energy. Why is this? Well, it's because all the air currents, all the wind on the earth is really caused by temperature, mainly by temperature differentials, which are caused by insolation or incoming solar radiation. Okay. Now, with, um, with, uh, with these huge wind turbines, blades are forced to rotate by the wind, which in turn operate a generator producing electricity probably doesn't surprise you that the bigger the blades, the more power output. And the biggest blades that are in use are up to around 40 meters. And so this picture shows you kind of what it looks like inside. Imagine climbing up that high to uh, maintain this thing. It would be kind of fun. The costs are highly variable, and it depends on how big the turbines are and a lot of other factors. But generally in the five to $5,000 per kilowatt, okay, um, they're about 25 to 30% efficient, and they're most efficient in wind speeds between 6 and 14 meters per second, and that's, that's important for you to know that, okay? All right, so we can make, of course, a Sankey diagram for wind energy extraction, okay? So here's the 30% that's useful. We have some loss to the grid. We have some about 25% friction in the engine and the aerodynamic limits, um, turbulence and so forth, okay? Now let's analyze this a little bit because there's an equation that you need to be able to use that's given to you in your IB data booklet with the power uh, generated with wind energy extraction. So let me go ahead and derive it for you, okay? If you consider a column of air with, of a cross-sectional area A and with air passing through at speed V right here, okay? All right, so this is like this, this is like a column of air hitting the area A spanned by the blades, okay? The length of this tube is going to be V delta T because V is obviously the length over delta T, okay? And the mass of the air in the tube is, of course, the density of the air times the volume, all right? And the volume is going to be the cross-sectional area times the length of that cylinder, right? That's A V delta T. That's also the mass that's going to exit in a time delta T. Now, the kinetic energy of that air is going to be one-half mv squared, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this expression for mass there, okay? And notice that when I do the math here, I end up with a factor of v cubed here, okay? Now, since kinetic energy over time is power, I then have the equation that's given to you in your data booklet, which is p equals one-half rho a v cubed, where v is the wind speed and a is the cross-sectional area of the blades. Now, we're often given the length of one blade, okay? Um, which, of course, is the radius of a circle. Sometimes we're given the diameter, so you have to be very careful about what you're given, all right? Now, the advantages of wind power, obviously, it's free, essentially inexhaustible, again, clean for the environment, no, no emissions, and it's ideal for remote locations. Now, the fact that it can be done in remote locations is also a disadvantage because we have to then transport that energy, that electricity, from these remote locations to cities. So that's also a disadvantage. Obviously, works only in windy places. Pretty low power output. That's why you need to build many of them. They're large and noisy. People don't like to look at them, so there's kind of a big, big issue with that. And they're fairly high maintenance costs. Okay, let's do an example near San Francisco, uh, USA. The wind blows at an average speed of 12 meters per second. If you've ever been to San Francisco, you know that um, you know that it can be pretty windy there. Okay, and the reason why it gets windy there is because hot air rises above the land, especially in the summertime, 
and cold air moves in from the sea to replace it. That's why the Golden Gate, which is where the Golden Gate Bridge is, is a very, very, very windy spot, okay? Um, so it's a good place, in theory, to build uh, wind turbines, right? There are tons of wind turbines in the hills, the coastal hills east of San Francisco, okay? Anyway, the wind turbines there are 40% efficient, and if you assume the air density to be 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter, determine the power extracted from a turbine having a diameter of 77 meters, okay? We can work this out. All we do is we just apply this equation, okay? Um, notice that for my area, I'm doing pi r squared, so that's going to be, r is going to be half of 77, I get 1.9 megawatts, okay? All right, and our last, I think this is our last example, all right? So a turbine, uh, a turbine with a turbine blade length of 54 meters is operated in a wind speed of 10 meters per second. Density of air again is 1.2. How much power is in the wind passing through the turbine? Okay, again, it's an application of this quite simple equation. I got 5.5 megawatts. How much power can be generated if the turbine is 20% efficient? Well, no kidding. These are very simple calculations. 20% of 5.5 is 1.1. More interestingly, if the wind speed increased to 15 meters per second, how much power would be produced? Okay, well, all you do is you just use the same numbers, but then you're replacing the 10 by the 15, and you get 19 megawatts. Now, remember that this equation holds only for certain ranges. Um, remember I said it was, what, 6 to 14? So anything really above 14 or 15, it's not going to, there are going to be other issues that will take into account where the power uh, produced is going to be less.